and welcome to this special interactive edition of the Global Conversation. I'm joined by the European Commission President, Jose Manuel Barroso. He's just delivered his State of the Union address and we'll be talking about that, but also the issues that matter to you most. We've had loads of questions coming in on our social media platforms. Mark Davis, who's our online editor, has been tracking those. Mark, what can you tell us? Well, I'm monitoring the reaction on the social networks. I'll be taking some of the comments and the questions posted by people online and I'll be putting them directly to President Barroso. Now, when this interview ends on air in about 20 minutes, it continues online in a Google Plus Hangout, a kind of video web chat. And joining President Barroso in that will be our panellists, who you may be able to see down here. They've got things they're very keen to ask him, but anyone can ask a question. Just use the hashtag AskBarroso and I'll try and ask it. Thank you very much, Mark, and thank you, President. Now, we want to go straight to Syria. Do you echo the scepticism and caution that's been sounded by the US regarding the Russian plan on chemical weapons? Uh, we believe it, uh, we should try it, but of course there are good reasons to be skeptical because uh, as you know, until recently, the Syrian regime was denying to be in possession of chemical weapons. And now they are saying that they are ready to accept international control and, uh, let's say, neutralization of these weapons. So we should be uh, skeptical, but I believe we should try to have that solution because uh, the European Union has always stated that uh, for the overall conflict, only a political uh, process can give a lasting solution. So if, so if this didn't work, would you then support military action? I'm not going to make now uh, hypothetic answers to hypothetic situations. The position of the European Union is well known. We believe that uh, we um, should have a strong reaction of the international community to what was an horrendous crime and the violation of uh, international law and the crime against uh, humanity, indeed. Uh, that, that reaction should be taken uh, uh, using, of course, the United Nations as source of international legitimacy. That's why we are now pursuing in the United Nations these efforts. And, of course, uh, that uh, apart from that, it's very important also the humanitarian aspect. And that is direct responsibility of the European Commission. I want to tell you that uh, the European Union is by far the biggest provider of aid to the Syrian people and to including refugees in the neighboring countries. Well, we received a tweet from Lise in Denmark and she said, last year you said the European Union has a responsibility for a new and democratic Syria. And she asks, what will the EU do? And what will you do if Bashar al-Assad were to stay in power? Would you work with Syria still for that new democracy? Look, uh, the Syria situation is very complex and I believe it's now a civil war. It became a civil war. It started with the uh, aggression of the Assad regime to its own people. Uh, but now it's difficult, of course, to have a, a complete, a clear uh, picture of the situation there. But would you be prepared to work with him again? We are uh, prepared to work with the Syrian people and to facilitate a minimum of consensus uh, in that uh, country. I've been, you see, I've been, for instance, with refugees. I've been in a, a Zatari camp in the north of Jor Jordan. I saw hundreds of, of young girls. I was in the young girls part that was, are studying now under tents. They are living there. It's a tragedy, a humanitarian tragedy of the incredible proportion. These were, some of them were coming from villages that were destroyed mm -hmm. by the Assad regime. They were having a complete normal life. And now, as the director, uh, executive director of UNICEF told me, without European Union support, they could not be they're studying. So it's a humanitarian tragedy of the biggest proportions. We need to, to act, and that's why we have to explore the political, um, um, let's say, the political path as well. OK, uh, President, we're going to have to move on to other issues now, European issues. Mm -hmm. And one of the major challenges we're facing, of course, is unemployment. We received a question from James in the United Kingdom on that. Efforts to reduce the unemployment rate has failed so far. What efforts are you going to make over the next 12 months to actually see the reduction in unemployment rates both in Greece, Spain and other countries? Thank you. 
To be fair, there has been a slight decrease in unemployment rates, but not enough to change the overall figure, which stands at 12.1%. What's going wrong? <laughs> What's going on wrong is the economic situation of some of the, our member states, because uh, it's in fact a situation that, as I said yesterday, it's um, socially unacceptable, political untenable, and economically also unsustainable. Uh, we are doing everything we can at European level. But let's not forget this employment is mainly a national competence. The employment policies are a national competence. But precisely because of the crisis, we are mobilizing all tools and indeed asking member states to give us more instruments to fight unemployment. That's why we proposed a youth guarantee. We are, have now put six, in fact, there will be eight billion euros for the youth employment initiative that we are going to front load. It means that we are going to uh, implement it in the first years uh, of the next um, budget uh, period. And uh, uh, we are working also in terms of skills, in terms of uh, um, making sure that the skills corresponds to demand in the market. I've launched this global alliance for, for uh, digital uh, jobs. We are working with transnational companies. But frankly, and let's be honest and realistic about it, it depends also on the reforms the governments are doing or not doing in the countries so that they create a more, let's say, um, favorable environment to the creation of new jobs, namely okay. for young people. OK, but if we're going to be realistic about it, some of your critics are saying you're being completely unrealistic with this 8 billion euros that is not going to make a difference, that it's a drop in the ocean if we're looking at the major problem of youth unemployment, which is five and a half million young people, eight billion euros is just not enough. First of all, uh, there are more resources in the social fund that we can mobilise. Uh, it depends now on the member states willing to do it. And secondly, this was the money that the governments accepted to put at disposal of the European Union. I, will, I, I have fought for more. The European Commission wanted more. Let's be clear about this. The European Parliament as well. But so so you fact, would say the 8 billion isn't enough? We do I, need I more. think let, let's start with them. Let, let's start to use this. Because one thing it uh, uh, sometimes strikes me, that in instead of doing the things, people start to, to, to speculate about other opportunities. The reality is that so far, not one euro has been spent. Because this is money for the period that starts in 1st of January 2014. And what I'm urging the governments of Europe to do is to adapt, to adopt as soon as possible the regulations so that we can have the programs up and running on the ground from the 1st of January 2014. Meanwhile, what we have done, I created teams for eight countries, that the countries that have the highest uh, youth and employment, and we have mobilized money from the structural funds that are for other purposes for this quick action, and this, this is going on, and that is already producing some results. But the challenge is indeed immense, I have to say. So you're frustrated uh, with national government's slow response. I'll have to actually stop you there, because I'm hearing Mark has uh, something for us uh, that he's receiving on social media. Yeah, there's been a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of tweets, act activity on Google Plus and Facebook um, about the economy, and it's particularly about young people and unemployment. We've got a tweet here from Maximo Micinilli, and he asks, uh, the economic crisis has been severe. Which messages do you have for young Europeans to still believe in the EU as a project? Uh, I have a message of confidence. In fact, I believe the latest figures we have, not only we in the European Union, but also OECD, are showing uh, that we are starting a recovery. We are not yet out of the crisis. Uh, how could we be out of the crisis with these very high figures of unemployment? But, in fact, the figures of the second quarter of this year and also the soft data that we are receiving in terms of consumer confidence, investor confidence, in terms of the stock markets, buying equities in Europe, and also uh, the so-called advanced indicators show that there are um, good news coming. It's still a fragile recovery. Also in employment, we have seen either a stabilization of the unemployment or even a decrease it's an uneven in some picture. countries. It's a very, it's uneven, a very uneven picture. But that's why we are pushing the governments to make the necessary reforms, because some of them, in fact, uh, have been successful in this fight against unemployment. A, go a concrete example. Vocational training is very important. At the same time that we have many young people unemployed, we have 
many firms that are asking for people in, with uh, uh, ICT competences. There is uh, a demand for people to work in the health sector. So there is a, a mismatch. We have also created a portal in the European Union called EURES that puts precisely the information available of jobs that are available in the European uh, market. You mentioned the growth, but the growth rate is, as you said, small, 0.3%. Mm -hmm. And many economists are saying that is not sufficient to reach escape velocity out of this crisis, that we are going to see anemic growth and therefore minimal impact, impact on unemployment. 0.3 for the quarter. So if we analyse it, it's quite... But they're uh, saying the future for projections instance, are uh, also anemic. For instance, my country, Portugal, had a growth of 1.1 1 .1, uh, the second quarter, but after Greece, many, many, many... Uh, Greece's uh, economy contracted. ...quarters uh, in the red. No, Greece, I think they are on the right track in terms of the, they are expecting a primary surplus. So I believe uh, we have to recognize the huge sacrifices made by the Greek people. And I believe uh, uh, with determination, Greece will come to positive uh, figures. But we have to remind ourselves why we are in this situation. <laughs> why? It came with the financial crisis that, by the way, did not start in Europe, but also it was the result of overspending by the national governments, including the case of Greece, but also irresponsible behaviour in the financial sector. And now we are correcting things. This takes time. Let's be honest about it. Let's not prom promise what we cannot deliver. But in fact, a lot has been done, first of all, to avoid the dismantling of the euro, to, the, to avoid situations that would have been much, much more difficult and painful for our citizens. OK, but the International Monetary Fund admitted it made mistakes in Greece. What mistakes would you admit to? I think we have been basically um, supporting Greece. And we have have been you made, would you admit to the fact that mistakes were made there? Basically, no. Our position has been always that we need to um, pursue fiscal consolidation, but we have always highlighted from the beginning that this was not the only policy. There were structural reforms that were necessary. For instance, privatization was necessary. So uh, it's a caricature to present the European Union policy uh, in the uh, euro area as just fiscal consolidation. We have, of course, countries with this huge debt have to make an effort to put their public finances in order, but we have advocating investment uh, and uh, a growth-friendly fiscal consolidation and more structural reforms. Greece has done a lot with great sacrifices of its people in terms of the uh, fiscal uh, side, but the structural reforms took some time mm -hmm. to start. Now, I believe they are doing uh, with more determination what is necessary for their recovery. And other countries, uh, um, Portugal, um, Ireland, that has already um, been able to go to the markets with success, um, Spain, that has a program just for the banking sector, what they are doing in terms of reforms, for instance, in terms of correcting their external balances, is really amazing. I'm going to have to cut you there, President, and we're going to move on to another question. And this is a question received from a celebrity. It's uh, the director of the award-winning film The Artist, which won five Academy Awards. J'avais une question à vous poser qui était de savoir, sachant, euh, parce que vous savez aussi bien que moi, que le système français de financement du cinéma euh, est très bon, pourquoi vous avez comme politique de vouloir le détruire plutôt que d'essayer de l'exporter aux autres pays euh, d'Europe, ce qui serait plutôt une manière de créer des emplois, de créer du lien social, de créer euh, des histoires, et pourquoi pas de la joie so here he's obviously speaking about the EU-US trade deal, the cultural exception. Mm. But beyond that, in some respects, what underlies this for me is this growing sense of mistrust top down across all levels of society, including intellectuals and influential people like this director at the EU. People don't trust the EU anymore. Mm. Shall I answer in French or in English? In English. Because we are speaking about cultural diversity. Yeah. I, I will be happy to, this, to respond directly in French because the question was in French. First of all, my congratulations to the director because I've seen the movie and it is indeed a great success. By the way, that movie received support from the European Union, the European Commission. We have the media programme and we have the biggest programme of support to 
uh, cultural diversity that exists in Europe. He doesn't think so. I'm sorry, but uh, no, because he was referring to other issues that I think there was a misinformation or a misunderstanding, probably uh, not completely innocent. We are for... Sorry, not completely innocent. Uh, would you say that you were misinterpreted? I, or that I think that uh, I was misinterpreted and also... We're talking here about the reactionary statement. Exactly. Um, and my statements were uh, from some quarters. They were uh, explicitly changed. I have never said that uh, um, it's reactionary, uh, the French system. On the contrary, I support the cultural diversity. What I said is that some arguments against globalization are reactionary because they don't take in consideration the evolution of the world and the opportunities that also globalization offers us. So, but one point I want to make clear, nobody defends more cultural diversity than the European Commission. What and about the sense never, of mistrust? We have never proposed to eliminate cultural diversity okay. from the negotiation in the United States. Let's move on to the next issue of mistrust, though. What about mistrust? We've seen a Eurobarometer no. poll which has shown we are the six biggest European nations that trust in the EU is at an all-time low. I, I have I, to ask you to be brief on this. I've seen the Eurobarometer for all the 28 countries, not but only I'm, six. Yeah, but the six big countries. And the, the reality is that there is more mistrust in the national governments than in European institutions. Yeah, but I'm asking uh, you about yeah. the European no, institutions. But I want to make the point that, of course, in times of severe economic hardship, the citizens, the common citizens, are frustrated. They look at their leaders, not only at European leaders, at national leaders, at national parties, at uh, financial sector leaders, and they are angry, and rightly so. But, but that does not mean that the European Union only is to blame. That means that there is a, a real crisis, an unprecedented crisis, that creates problems that we are trying to address, and I'm making the case explaining what we are doing, what we can do, also what we cannot do, and I think this is the serious answer. Of course I'm aware of the dissatisfaction with the citizens regarding the European Union, but if you look in the but same... Do you, take, do, you take, do you say take a certain amount of responsibility for that? Of course, all of us have a responsibility, and I'm ready to, to assume that responsibility. Mark is coming back to us, I think. Yeah, well, one of the, another one of the themes that seems to be coming back again and again, uh, and it has been over the last few weeks, is Euroscepticism. Now, again, on Twitter, Sophia has asked, how will the EU cope with all these Eurosceptic parties in the member states? Are they a serious threat for the EU as we know it? I think it depends on the other parties and on those who are in favour of Europe. Uh, and precisely, I'm asking the uh, those who are in favour of Europe to come out, to stand up and defend what uh, Europe means, what uh, Europe can do to help uh, citizens solve their problems. But I believe, uh, being more concrete, that in next European elections, the political forces, the moderate political forces from the centre-left to the centre-right that are basically pro-European will keep a you strong think, majority. You don't think there'll be big Eurosceptic gains as has been predicted? They may be gaining some ground, yes, but I believe the huge majority of the Europeans uh, will remain uh, very much uh, in the pro-European side. We're very short of time, but uh, I did get a question on Twitter, which I was going to ask you anyway. And uh, that was from Victor in Ukraine. And he's asking, would you like to stand again for a third term as Commission President? Now, obviously, would you, if you were given the chance? Uh, look, um, yes or no? I have not uh, uh, thought about myself in this matter. Would you we like have, I have one year more of mandate, more than one year. One year uh, is an eternity. I think... Two mandates of five years is already a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody, even the critics, recognise that it has been extremely tough times for all of us. But I don't want now to speak about myself. I think the time now is to roll up our sleeves and not to throw in the towel. So I'm focused on what we have to do for Europe and not on my personal, uh, let's say, future after uh, next year. We've got seconds left now. I just want a very quick answer here. If uh, Europeans are to look back at a concrete achievement you have left them with, in your time in office as Commission President, what would it be? Many. <laughs> From the climate policy to protect our planet, that is the most ambitious policy in the world, that I'm very happy because some people are still denying that there is climate uh, change, to uh, concrete issues like, for instance, reducing the roaming charges for people that uh, uh, travel, and namely during the crisis, to avoid countries like Greece or Ireland or Portugal 
to become insolvent because in that case is to have to go out of the euro because in that case well, we, we will be in a real much more dramatic situation. Okay, well, we're going to have to close this chapter of the global conversation. Now, we've got our next chapter, which is about to open on Euronews.com. Mark Davis is there with his panel of Europeans who are raring to go to challenge you. So please join us in that next chapter of the global conversation.